Now the first practice question is related to an important theme in the economy section which is related to human development, poverty, inequality and unemployment. So in this line this question is related to the human capital index. So before solving this question let us look at the way in which UPSC has asked questions related to the topics of human development, poverty etc. So if you look at this question it was asked in the year 2019. And this question reads, in the context of any country, which one of the following would be considered as a part of its social capital? Now, social capital simply refers to the intangible relational assets that emerge from the social interactions in a society. And these assets are generated through the norms of give and take and also the norms of reciprocity that develop due to the social interactions in a society. Now a good example of social capital are the self-help groups that are functioning in different parts of India. And besides undertaking economic activity, these self-help groups create assets in terms of the social value that they create. For example, they help in women empowerment, they also help in removing the poverty in different parts of India. So if you look at the options given here, the most appropriate option is the option D which reads the level of mutual trust and harmony that exists in a society can be considered as social capital in any country. And this concept of social capital is explained beautifully in the NCRT of sociology. So this again highlights the need for going through the basic subjects NCRTs which can be very important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. Again if you look at this question it was asked in the year 2018 and it reads consider the following statements. The human capital formation as a concept is better explained in terms of the process which enables. So the options that are given here are that individuals of a country to accumulate more capital, increasing the knowledge, skill levels and capacities of the people of the country, accumulation of tangible wealth and fourth is the accumulation of intangible wealth. Now this concept of human capital formation has been explained beautifully in the NCRT of class 11th of Indian economic development. And if you read about this you will find that it refers to investment in the human development in terms of education, health etc. and which will lead to further growth of the nation. So this human capital formation is different from the physical capital formation that is created because of the investments in the resources by the owner of that capital. So similarly the investment in human capital is done in terms of education and health and hence if you look at the second statement it reads that increasing the knowledge skill levels and capacities of the people of the country refers to the human capital formation. However the investment in education and health and the returns from these investments are not a part of the tangible wealth and hence the third statement given here is incorrect and hence it is a part of accumulation of intangible wealth which cannot be exactly calculated. So the correct answer that comes out is C that is 2 and 4. So both these previous year questions that we have looked at highlight the importance of going through the NCRT and the important concepts that have been discussed in these NCRTs. Again if you look at this question it was asked in the year 2012 and it was related to an important index which is related to the poverty. So this question reads the multi-dimensional poverty index developed by the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative with the UNDP support covers which of the following. So if you go through the multi-dimensional poverty index you will find that it includes deprivation of education, health, assets and services at the household level. And the correct answer that comes out is A that is one only. So after this let us look at this practice question which is related to a very important index which is known as the human capital index and the question reads consider the following statements about the human capital index. First is that this index is released by the world economic forum. Second is that it measures the amount of human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by the age of 18 years. And third statement is that the per capita income is one of the components of this index. Now this human capital index is sometimes compared with the human development index which is a very important tool for capturing or measuring the human development in society. And this human development index is based on three pillars which include the long and healthy life which is calculated based on life expectancy at the birth. Second is the knowledge which is calculated based on mean years of schooling and third is the standard of living which is calculated in terms of the gross national income at purchasing power parity. 
So now if you learn about the human capital index, you will find that it is not released by the World Economic Forum, but is released by the World Bank. And hence this first statement given here is incorrect. So by eliminating this, you can easily eliminate the options B, C and D. So the correct answer that comes out is A, that is two only. Now the human capital index measures the amount of human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by the age of 18 and it conveys the productivity of the next generation of workers compared to a benchmark of complete education and full health. And it is constructed for 157 countries and it is made up of five indicators and these include the probability of survival to the age of five, a child's expected years of schooling, harmonized test scores as a measure of quality of learning, an adult survival rate, which is fraction of 15 years old that will survive to the age of 60 and the proportion of children who are not stunted. So these are the five indicators which are included in the human capital index. And hence both these statements that is the second and the third statement are correct here. To learn more about human capital index, you should go through the prelims compass of this year where important indices and reports which were in news have been discussed in detail. And they can be very important for us from the preliminary examination point of view as you might have seen that a lot of questions have been asked related to important indices in the previous years. With this, let's take up the next question now. Now this next question is related to another important theme in the economy section and which is related to the skill development. And this question is related to the new changes that have been made to the apprentice rules which were introduced in 2019. Now before this, let us look at the previous year questions that have been asked related to skill development. Now, if you look at these questions, it was asked in the year 2018 and these two questions were asked in the year 2017. And all these questions are related to important initiatives of the government of India, which are related to the skill development. So this question that was asked in 2018 reads with reference to the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, consider the following statements. First is that it is the flagship scheme of the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Second is that it, among other things, will also impart training in soft skills, entrepreneurship, financial and digital literacy. And third is that it aims to align the competencies of the unregulated workforce of India to the national skill qualification framework. Now, if you learn about this Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, you will find that it is not a flagship scheme of the Ministry of Labor and Employment and it is the flagship scheme of Ministry of Skill Development and hence by this, you can eliminate the options A and B. However, the other two options that are given here are correct regarding the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana. And hence the correct answer that comes out is C, that is statements two and three only are correct in this question. Again, if you look at this question that was asked in 2017, it reads with reference to the national skills qualification framework, which of the statements given below is or are correct. First is that under the NSQF, a learner can acquire the certification for competency only through the formal learning. Second is that an outcome expected from the implementation of NSQF is the mobility between vocational and general education. Now under this national skills qualification framework, there is no condition that the certification for competency can only be acquired through formal learning and it can be acquired through both the formal as well as informal learning also and hence the first statement is incorrect. However, the second statement is correct because it is one of the objectives of creation of national skills qualification framework and hence the correct answer is B that is two only. Again, this question was asked in 2017 and it reads recognition of prior learning scheme is sometimes mentioned in news with reference to and it refers to certifying the skills which are acquired by the construction workers through the traditional channels and hence A was the correct answer here. So by solving these questions, we find that questions can be asked related to the government of India's initiatives, which specially target skill development in India, because we note that skill development is one of the important pillars of reaping the benefits of demographic dividend in India. And if you look at this question, it reads, consider the following statements about the changes in the apprentice rules introduced in 2019. First is that the wages to the apprentices have been linked to the minimum wages. Second is that all the establishments having more than 30 employees have to mandatorily employ apprentices. And third is that the upper limit for engaging the apprentice 
has been increased. Now in this question, you just need to note that the wages to the apprentices have not been linked to the minimum wages. And by this, you can easily strike down the first statement that is given here. And by just knowing this information, you can eliminate the options A, B and D. So while solving questions in the preliminary examination, always look for the wrong statements first. And hence the correct answer that comes out is C that is 2 and 3 only. That is all the establishments having more than 30 employees have to mandatorily employ apprentices. And third is that the upper limit for engaging the apprentices has been increased. And all these initiatives or changes in the rules have been introduced in order to impart skill development to the apprentices and also encouraging the apprentices in the Indian industry. Now some of these changes that have been introduced in the rules regarding the apprentices have been discussed in detail in the prelims compass of economy section. So do go through that and learn more about these new changes which have been introduced. With this, let's take up the next question now. Now this third practice question is related to an important act known as the International Financial Services Centers Authority Act of 2013. And this act aims at attracting investments in the industrial sector. So before solving this question, let us look at the previous year questions that have been asked related to development of the industrial sector. So if you look at these previous year questions, they were asked in the year 2017, 16 and 2012. And this question that was asked in 2017 reads, with reference to the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, which of the following statements is or are correct? First is that it is an organ of Niti Aayog, and second is that it has a corpus of rupees 4 lakh crores at present. And if you read about this new initiative, which was a current affair in the year 2017, it is not an organ of Niti Aayog. And the second statement is also incorrect because it initially had a corpus of rupees 40,000 crore only. And hence the correct answer was D that is neither one nor two. Now in this, this first statement can again be easily eliminated because Niti Aayog does not have any financial power. Further, if you look at this question that was asked in 2016, it reads, Recently, India's first National Investment and Manufacturing Zone or the NMIZ was proposed to be set up in. So it was proposed to be set up in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And again, if you look at this question, it reads, what is or are the recent policy initiatives of the government of India to promote the growth of manufacturing sector? First is the setting up of national investment and manufacturing zones. Second is the providing the benefit of single window clearance. And third is establishing the technology acquisition and development fund. And all these three initiatives were correct in that year. So the correct answer was D1, 2 and 3. So by looking at these previous year questions, we find that UPSC has been asking questions related to important initiatives of the government of India, which aim at boosting the manufacturing sector. So now if you look at this practice question, it reads, consider the following statements about International Financial Services Centers Authority Act 2013. First is that the International Financial Services Centers are established under the Special Economic Zones Act 2005. Second is that inside the IFSC centers, powers of the Reserve Bank of India will be exercised by the IFSCA or the authority which has been created by this act. And third statement is that the Union Finance Minister is the ex officio chairman of the IFSCA. Now if you carefully read the act, you will find that it sets up the International Financial Services Authority. And in this, it provides for nine members under this authority. And these nine members will be appointed by the central government. So the members will include the chairperson and also one member will be nominated from each of the financial regulators in India. That is the Reserve Bank of India, the SEBI, the IRDAI and the PFRDA. So all the important financial regulators will nominate one person each to this International Financial Services Centers Authority. And besides these members, two members from among the officials of the Ministry of Finance and two members will be appointed on the recommendations of a search committee. And these members will have a term of three years subject to reappointment. So this means that the third statement that is given here, that is the Union Finance Minister is the ex official chairman of IFSCA is incorrect. And by this, you can easily eliminate the options B, C and D. So the only options that we are left with are one and two and both are correct. So the correct answer that comes out is A, that is one and two only. 
now an important function that has been provided to the international financial services centers authority is that it will be the unified regulator under the ifsc centers so accordingly the act provides that the authority will regulate the financial products financial services and financial institutions which have been previously approved by any appropriate regulator in an ifsc and it will follow all processes which are applicable to such financial products financial services and financial institutions under their respective laws so in short all the financial services financial products and financial institutions under the ifsc centers will be regulated by this unified authority which has been created by ifsca and this has been done in order to provide ease of doing business within the ifsc centers so with this let us take up the next question now now this fourth question is related to an important bond which was in news and it is known as the elephant bond now if you look at the previous year questions you will find that in the year 2016 a question was asked related to another famous bond which is known as the ifsc masala bond and the question reads with reference to the ifsc masala bonds sometimes seen in the news which of the statements given below is or are correct first is that the ifc or the international finance corporation which offers these bonds is an arm of the world bank and the second is that they are the rupee dominated bonds and are a source of debt financing for public and private sector so in this regard we know that international finance corporation is an arm of the world bank group and hence the first statement given here is correct and regarding the masala bonds you need to understand that they are rupee dominated bonds and they are a source of debt financing for both the public as well as the private sector and hence the second statement is also correct so the correct answer is c both 1 and 2 now this fourth practice question reads consider the following statements about the elephant bonds first is that they have been recommended by the national infrastructure pipeline and second is that it is a tax amnesty scheme the proceeds of which will be used to fund the infrastructure projects which of the statements given above is or are correct Now regarding these elephant bonds you should note that the high level advisory group on trade policy or the HLAG which was headed by Surjit S Balla had recommended or suggested the government to issue the elephant bonds and this will help India to recover up to dollar 500 billion of black money that is stashed overseas further this elephant bond is a 25 year sovereign bond and it is called as a sovereign bond because it is a bond issued by a national government Further this bond is issued to those people who declare their previously undisclosed income and are then bound to invest 50% of that amount in these securities and the fund gathered by the issuance of these bonds will be utilized to finance infrastructure projects only and hence the correct answer is to here and first is incorrect because it was not suggested or recommended by the national infrastructure pipeline however it was suggested by the high level advisory group on trade policy so the correct answer that comes out is b that is two only so again we see that the question that was asked in 2016 was related to an initiative which aimed at financing the industry in india and again this question that we have created related to the elephant bonds is also related to financing of industrial or infrastructure projects in india with this let's take up the next question now now this fifth question is related to another important aspect in the indian economy which is known as the disinvestment and this question is related to another important aspect which is known as the strategic disinvestment of the public sector enterprises and you might be knowing that the government of india has recently decided for this new kind of disinvestment which is known as the strategic sale and in this line the government of india has decided that it will undertake the strategic sale of the bharat petroleum corporation limited so this question reads which of the following statements is or are correct about the strategic disinvestment of the public sector enterprises first is that the strategic partner must be public sector entity second is that under this the government can dilute its shares in a public sector enterprise up to only 50% and third is that it necessarily involves transfer of management control now the key aspects of strategic disinvestment as identified by the finance ministry says that the strategic disinvestment would imply the sale of a substantial portion of government share holding in public sector enterprises of up to 50% or such higher percentage as the competent authority may determine and it will also involve the transfer of management control 
So this means that the second statement that is given here is incorrect. However, the third statement is correct. That is, it necessarily involves a transfer of management control. And this is because the government of India wants that these public sector enterprises also get new kinds of innovations and transfer of technology. However, the second statement that is given here is incorrect because the government of India can dilute its shares up to 50% and even more than that. However, when it wants to dilute its share more than 50%, it needs to be authorized by a competent authority. Now regarding the first statement that is the strategic partner must be a private sector entity is not a correct statement. Because under strategic sale, a government can sell its shareholding in a public sector enterprises to both the public as well as private sector entity. And in this line, the government of India has clarified that it wants to sell 74.23% of the stake in the Tehri Hydro Development Corporation to an identified central public sector enterprise buyer, which means that this strategic sale will happen between two public sector enterprises and not necessarily the strategic partner must be a private sector entity. And hence the correct answer that comes out here is C that is three only. Now the strategic disinvestment is a very important aspect for us from the preliminary examination point of view because this has been one of the important decisions of the government of India for raising revenue and at the same time improving innovation in the already functioning or already well functioning public sector enterprises. With this let's take up the next question now. Now the sixth question is related to another important aspect of disinvestment in the Indian economy. So the question reads, which of the following statements is or are correct about the golden share? First is that it enables the entity owning it to veto the decisions of other shareholders. And second is that an entity can own golden share even when it does not hold the majority stake. Now the government of India is considering the introduction of this golden share in the disinvestment of the public sector enterprises. And it is doing so in order to have a say in the decision making of the public sector enterprises which are either being privatized or the government is divesting its stake in those public sector enterprises. So in this case the first statement that is given here is correct that it enables the entity owning it to veto the decisions of other shareholders. Second is that an entity can own golden share even when it does not hold majority stake is also correct. So it is not necessary for the government of India to have a majority stake in a public sector enterprise to veto the decisions of the other shareholders. And that is how the government of India will have an effective say in the management decisions of these public sector enterprises who are either being privatized or the government of India is divesting its share in those public sector enterprises. Now this concept of golden share was first introduced in the United Kingdom in 1980s. And it was done so, so that the government of UK has a say in the decision making of newly privatized public sector enterprises. And hence the correct answer here is C that is both 1 and 2. So both these aspects that is the strategic disinvestment of public sector enterprises and the concept of golden share are very important for us from the preliminary examination point of view and should be kept in mind. With this let's take up the next question now. Now the seventh question is related to the information technology agreement and this was in news in the month of September because India had imposed customs duty on information communication technology products and this move of India was opposed by the United States of America. So before looking at this question let us look at the previous year questions related to this particular theme. Now in the prelims practice discussion of the current affairs of July month we have already discussed questions related to the theme of international trade. And various questions have been asked previously in the year 2017, 2015 and 2016. And mostly these questions were related to the World Trade Organization. Again, if you look at this question that was asked in 2017, it was related to the domestic content requirement. And it was related to the development of solar power production in India. Again, if you look at this question that was discussed in the prelims practice of the current affairs of August month, it was related to the developing country status under the World Trade Organization. And we have already discussed question related to the generalized system of preferences in one of the prelims practice videos. So if you look at this question, it reads, consider the following statements about the information technology agreement. First is that it has been finalized under the aegis of United Nations Conference on Trade and Development or the UNCTAD. Second is that the ITA requires each participant to eliminate and bind Customs duties adds zero for all the products specified in the agreement. 
And again, the third statement is that India has not signed the ITA expansion agreement finalized in the year 2015. Now, this information technology agreement was finalized in the year 1996 after the formation of the World Trade Organization. And hence, it was finalized under the aegis of World Trade Organization. And hence, this first statement that is given here is incorrect. Now, by this, you can easily eliminate the options A, B and D. So the correct answer that comes out is C, that is 2 and 3 only. However, it is important to note that this information technology agreement requires the participants to eliminate and bind the customs duties at zero for all the products which are specified in the agreement. And initially, a number of products were identified under this agreement on which the member countries had to impose zero duties or zero custom duties. However, this information technology agreement was expanded in the year 2015. And in this, more number of ICT or the information communication technology products were added in the ITA agreement. However, this move was not accepted by India and it has imposed the customs duties on these newly added information communication technology products to the ITA expansion agreement. And as such, India is not a party to the ITA expansion agreement. However, it was initially a part of the original information technology agreement. And India has justified the imposition of customs duty on the ICT products by saying that it would lead to the improvement in the domestic ICT industry. And it wants to protect the domestic information communication technology industry against the import of foreign products. Now, it is interesting to note that in the mains examination of 2014, a question was asked related to the information technology agreement of the World Trade Organization. And this was mainly because this agreement or the expansion of the ITA agreement was being discussed in that year. And as such, it was finalized in the year 2015. And in this context, this becomes extremely important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. After this, let's take up the next practice question now. Now this next question is related to the infrastructure investment trusts. Now this is an initiative to increase the investment in the infrastructure projects in India. Now again this question that we have created reads with reference to the infrastructure investment trust in wit consider the following statements. First is that the government of India has a shareholding of more than 50% and second is that all the inwits are required to be registered with Reserve Bank of India. Now regarding these infrastructure investment trusts, you should note that they are similar to mutual funds and where the investors invest in these mutual funds and the mutual fund operators then again invest that money into various kinds of projects. However, these invests only invest in the infrastructure related projects. So that is the basic difference between the invests and the mutual funds. Now as the invests are similar to the mutual funds, the retail investors invest in these infrastructure investment trusts and it is not the government of India which invests in these invests. And hence this first statement given here is incorrect. That is the government of India has a shareholding of more than 50% here. Again, the second thing is that as these invests are similar to the mutual funds, these are to be registered with the Securities and Exchange Board of India or the CB and they are not registered with the Reserve Bank of India. So again, the second statement is also incorrect here. So the correct answer that comes out is D that is neither one nor two. Now current affairs related to infrastructure investment are important for us from the preliminary as well as mains examination point of view. Now, for example, the government of India came out with national manufacturing investment policy. And in this, the national manufacturing investment zones were to be created. And accordingly, a question was asked in the preliminary examination of 2013, which talked about the important features of the NMIZs that were being proposed to be created. So keep an eye on important initiatives related to increasing the infrastructure investment in India. So with this, let's take up the next question. Now the ninth question has been created based on one of the important current affairs that is related to the issue that has happened between the PepsiCo and the farmers or the potato farmers of Gujarat. And according to that issue, this act was continuously in news for past year. And it is known as the Protection of Plant Variety and Farmers Right Act 2001. So this question reads that the Protection of Plant Variety and Farmers Right Act 2001 was enacted by the India to provide for the establishment of an effective system for the protection of plant varieties and the rights of the farmers. 
and this law was enacted to give effect to which of the following agreements of WTO. Now, if you look at the question that was asked in the year 2019 in the preliminary examination, it reads, consider the following statements and the first statement is that according to the Indian Patents Act, a biological process to create a seed can be patented in India. Second statement is that in India, there is no intellectual property appellate board and third is that the plant varieties are not eligible to be patented in India. So regarding the first statement that according to the Indian Patents Act, a biological process to create a seed can be patented in India is incorrect. Secondly, the second statement is that in India, there is no intellectual property appellate board in India, which is also incorrect because there is an appellate board or intellectual property appellate board. And as we have eliminated the two statements, the only option that is left is C that is three only. And it reads that the plant varieties are not eligible to be patented in India. Now the rights that are granted under the Indian Patent Acts are different from the rights that are granted under the Protection of Plant Variety and Farmers Right Act of 2001. And the rights that are granted under the PPVFR Act are known as the Breeders Right, the Researchers Right and the Farmers Right. Now these breeders' rights are a different variety of rights as compared to the patent rights which are provided under the Indian Patent Acts. And according to the Indian Patent Acts, a biological process to create a seed cannot be patented in India. Secondly, the plant varieties also cannot be patented under the Indian Patents Act. However, as compared to the Indian Patents Act under the PPVFR Act, it provides intellectual property rights to plant breeders, researchers and farmers who have developed any new or extant variety or extant plant varieties. So under this PPVFR Act, special kinds of rights are provided which are known as the breeders right, the researchers is right or the farmers is right. And according to this act, under the breeders is right, the breeders will have exclusive rights to produce, sell, market, distribute, import and export the protected plant variety. So this means that these breeders rights are different from that of the intellectual property rights that are granted under the Indian Patents Act. And that is why although the breeders can protect their plant varieties under the Protection of Plant Variety and Farmers Rights Act of 2001, they cannot protect or get patents under the Indian Patents Act. And accordingly, the first statement in the question of 2019 was incorrect and the third statement was correct. Because the biological processes to create a seed variety cannot be patented in India under the Indian Patents Act. And the third statement that plant varieties are not eligible to be patented in India is correct because the plant varieties cannot be patented under the Indian Patents Act. However, the breeders get the breeders right when they create a new plant variety. And this breeder's right, which is a different category of right as compared to the patents, is protected under the PPVFR Act of 2001. Further, the question that we have created reads that the PPVFR Act was enacted by India to provide for the establishment of an effective system for the protection of plant varieties and the rights of farmers. This law was enacted to give effect to which of the following agreements of WTO. So as this act has been in news continuously, one should be aware that this law was created by India to give effect to the trade related intellectual property rights of the WTO or the TRIPS agreement of WTO. And hence the correct answer here is C. So this is an important issue and can be expected in your upcoming preliminary examination. With this, let's take up the last and final question for this discussion. Now this 10th question is related to another important topic in the economy section, which is the international multilateral organizations. And this 10th question reads, the poverty reduction and growth facility which lends to the world's poorest countries is an arm of which of the following? Now before this, let us look at some previous year questions related to the multilateral international organizations which have been asked in the preliminary examination. So this question reads, recently which one of the following currencies has been proposed to be added to the basket of IMFs, SDR or the special drawing rights? And you might be knowing that in the year 2016, Renminbi was added to the SDR basket and hence it is the correct answer and Renminbi is the Chinese currency. Again this next question that was asked in 2016 reads with reference to the International Monetary and Financial Committee IMFC consider the following statements. First is that the IMFC discusses matters of concern affecting the global economy 
and advises the International Monetary Fund on the direction of its work. Second is that the World Bank participates as observer in the IMFC's meetings. And both these aspects are correct regarding the International Monetary and Financial Committee or the IMFC. So the correct answer was C, both 1 and 2. Now normally when it comes to lending to the poorest countries, the role of World Bank is more pronounced. However, it was in the year 1999 that International Monetary Fund started or established this poverty reduction and growth facility. So in this case, the correct answer is C, that is, it is an arm of the International Monetary Fund. Now in this regard, we note that International Monetary Fund is responsible for ensuring stability in the monetary system of the globe. And accordingly, it has established various facilities for handling the situations. So for example, IMF lends to its member countries through the standby arrangements in case those countries face the problems of balance of payment crisis. And also IMF has created the exogenous shocks facility which lends to those countries which are facing deflationary pressures. And in this line, this poverty reduction and growth facility provides loans specially to the poorest of the countries. And hence it is one of the important arms of the International Monetary Fund. So these are few important aspects related to the IMF. However, you should read more about important initiatives of the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, etc and most of them have been provided in the prelims compass of economy.